Hi everyone, my name is George Garcia, and I am a community manager with Fusion 360 Electronics. Welcome to episode two of our A to Z project tutorial. So this is where we left off. You can see on my left side, I have the data panel, and we have our A to Z project open. In this episode, we're gonna be going through the schematic. And when I'm gonna go step by step, we're gonna put all the parts together, and I'm gonna show you what I'm thinking about as I go through the schematic development. So the first thing I wanna call your attention to, if we go into A to Z project, you're gonna see that I've created a library just for this project. So in this tutorial series, I do wanna focus on creating the project itself. We have a separate tutorial series for making library components. So I encourage you to check that out. It will be linked in the description. But for now, just know that we have this library ready and we're gonna use it to make our design. So the first thing I wanna do actually is make sure that I have that library in use, that A to Z library. So I'm gonna click here on our place components command. You can see it opens up this window. And right here I have access to the library manager. So I'm gonna go ahead and click it. And in the library manager, we can filter things by what's in use, what's not in use, the source of the library, if it's a Fusion Team library, if it's a library.io library. We can sort by updates being available, if it's using the current design, etc. So what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that this A to Z library is in use. So very simply, I can put in use and I can just type A to Z and it will filter down. Okay, and we can see it's in use. So I can already bring in my components. But as you can see, this is very powerful. There's a lot of functionality here. You can do all sorts of filter criteria. You can really make sure that what you want to be in use and that the libraries you need are available to you in the place components command. So I'm happy with this. I already have the library I need in use. If ever you see that the library you want is not, then you go to the library manager and you can adjust. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear my search. And you can see these are all the libraries that are in use. Depending on where they're from, the icon will change. So if you see, hover over, it'll tell you it's stored on library.io. And this is the icon for anything that is a managed library. If you look at this, stored on Fusion Team. Makes it really clear where your library is stored, where it's coming from. So with that, let's go to Place Components and I'm gonna go ahead and start adding components. Now here, you can see that the Place Components command has everything filtered, uh, has everything available, all libraries. So you can see I have about almost 17,000 components available. So to get a little bit more real estate, I'm gonna go ahead and close the data panel. And since I already told you everything I need for the simplicity of the tutorials in that A to Z library, I can go here and I can simply have it go to A to Z. So if I only want to look at that library, I select it. And now the only components that I have access to that I've filtered down to are in this A to Z library. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on this dial. This is the first thing I want to put in. Okay, and you'll see it's there floating on my mouse cursor. If we look here on the bottom left side, you can see what the symbol is, what the 2D footprint is, and what the 3D model is for this component. So you get plenty of previews. It's easy to figure out what you're inserting into your design. So I'm just gonna place one. I'm gonna go back over here. I wanna put in the frame, double click it. And if you're really looking to be as fast as possible, Generally, the best workflow is to put in all your components in first, just because this part of the process is so fluid, then you can start connecting them. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do here. I often find that I usually forget one or two parts, but it's very easy to put them in later. So I have my diode. Next, I'm gonna bring in my potentiometer. So again, double click it. I have five of these for this design. I'm gonna go ahead and put in one, two, three, four, five. I'm just placing them arbitrarily right now. Later on, as I go through this process, I'll lay them out better. Right now, I just wanna put in all of my parts. So I have one LED. Now, if you notice in a component like this one, all of the package variants can be previewed. So in my case, I wanna get the five millimeter LED because it has a, already a nice 3D model. So I'm gonna select it. 
you see that at the bottom, you can tell that that's the one that's available. I have attributes. I can check any attributes that are with the part. So this is really easy to know exactly what you're going to bring in. Just double click. And now I can bring in my one LED. Okay. Next, I'm going to bring in my transistors. Okay, I need two of these. Just kind of put them here. I'm going to go ahead and bring in my polarized capacitors now. Bring in three of them. What I need for this design. There's three. Okay, next. I'm going to bring in just my normal surface mount. I want to use surface mount capacitors for this design. This makes everything tidy. I'm going to use the 0805 capacitors. Okay, again, I'm going to need four of these. I'll adjust their values later. Four, okay, good. Let's bring in our resistors now. Again, these will be surface mount. And I need seven of these. Five, six. Yeah, I'm just placing them. Next, let's go ahead and just kind of zoom in a little bit. Let me make sure we have a good view. There we go. Next, I have a few headers. Let's go ahead and bring those in. I have this one. This is just a two pin. Okay, need one of these. Okay. And then I'm gonna need a four pin also. Okay, there we are. Okay, good. So that should be everything. If I miss any components, I'll come back and, and put them in later. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start kind of arranging the schematic. And now we just have to do everything, just moving things around, kind of making it organized. So I'm going to start just arranging things. It's not going to be too much talking in this section. But you'll see if there's anything noteworthy, I will highlight it. Now to rotate while moving, you can just right click and that'll do a rotation for you. Makes it really easy. And to grab, it's just a matter of left clicking and dragging. So very straightforward. If I want to select a group of things and then move all of that as a group and I make some space, I can just put everything over here. You can zoom in and out by just moving our, our scroll wheel backwards and forwards. So ideally, you want to have a three button mouse. That way you can scroll forward and backward using the scroll wheel. Okay, so right there we have most of our preliminary placement. Now I'm going to go ahead and interconnect everything. So at this point, you'll probably see some things be nudged around, moved around, but it's all in the name of trying to make the schematic as readable as possible. That's the name of the game with a schematic. You want it to be clear. You want design intent to be easily understood by anyone looking at it, especially yourself a few months down the road. So we're going to use the net command and start making connections. We can always tidy things up later.
Now you may be wondering, well, what makes it so easy to get everything connected this fast? Obviously, we have the auto snap. But on top of that, if you notice, I'm using a 0.1 inch grid on the schematic. And this is something that we highly, highly recommend you always do. On the schematic and anything related to the schematic, you want to stick to a 0.1 inch grid. If you prefer to work in metric units, go ahead and change it to metric. It'll be 2.54 millimeters, but do not change the absolute value. The reason for this is that everything in electronics libraries is built to that 0.1 inch grid. If you deviate from that on the schematic symbols, you're gonna, you could find that it will be hard to get things to connect and that'll create issues down the road. So we very, 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 very strongly encourage sticking to a 0.1 inch grid. It's going to save a lot of difficulty down the road. So stick to the 0.1 inch grid or its metric equivalent of 2.54 millimeters. Now let's keep making our connections. You notice that it will automatically adjust the bend. And that's just something that continues to make the connections easier. You know, having arrived at this point, I realized that I have not brought in my supply symbols. So I'm going to make a couple more connections. I'm going to connect the diode here. And I'm going to connect this end of the capacitor over here. Okay, and we're going to bring in our supply symbols. Now you'll see whenever you connect a supply symbol to a net, it's basically going to ask you if you want to merge the names. In other words, if you want the net that you just connected to become plus 9B. The answer is yes. And every time you run into one of these, the answer is usually going to be yes. There's very, very few occasions where you do not click yes. So we click yes. And we'll see it's happy. Everything is connected. And we can verify it using the show command. So if, for example, I can activate it here, typing in show, this is the command line interface, or press enter, it will activate the command, and if I click on a net, it will highlight everything that's connected to it. This is a good way to verify that everything is connected that should be connected. Okay. So I can go back to the net command, keep adding nets, you can also activate the show command by clicking on the eyeball icon. So you'll find that up here in the document menu, in the design menu, and also down here on this bar. For now, we're just going to keep making our connections. Let's make sure we have everything. Okay, everything is connected now. Except this connector, which we're going to talk about in a second. Now, one thing I want to highlight is through the use of supply symbols, we help keep our schematic clear. Basically, wherever there is a, a supply symbol, all those nodes are automatically connected, even though I don't draw a point to point net connecting them. So everywhere you see plus 9V, all those nets are connected. Similar situation with the ground symbol. Now, if you notice, I still have a few locations where I haven't added, added nets, specifically the wiper of RP4, one of the legs of RP1, and the end of the LED. And these we're going to connect using stubs. What are stubs? Stubs are net segments that don't end at another connection point. So there's one stub, here's another stub, and one over here. Okay, now what are these good for? Well, in Fusion 360 Electronics, connections are defined by net name. So as long as two nets, two little net segments, have the same name, they are connected. Even if there isn't a physical net drawn and, and routed connecting the two points. So for example, I'm going to use a name command, which is this one right here. And I'm going to click on the net. You'll see that it has a name. 
Every net has a name. It's a requirement in electronics in order to be able to have a net list that we can then pass on to the board. Now, by default, these are just generic names. However, we can assign specific names to nets of interest. So, for example, this is my input. So, I'm going to click OK. You'll notice there's a checkbox that says Place Label. What that allows me to do is now I have a label to show the net's name. So, if I right click again, I can rotate it. I'm going to say this is input. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing over here because the command stays active. This is a key thing in all the commands in electronics. The, net, the, the commands stay active until you either explicitly cancel them or you select a new command. I'm going to click here. I'm going to say output. Let's minimize this so we can see. There we are. Okay. I'm going to call this one here. LED. Okay. So now we have an input net, an output net, and an LED net. And I want them to connect to this JP2 connector. Now I could connect them directly, right? I could just go with the net command and draw it out, make the connection. However, you can envision that in a tight schematic, that might clutter things up. Not so much here on the LED connection, on the output connection, but if I have to draw from the input to here, it's going to go all the way around the whole circuit, and that's going to make things uh, more difficult to read. So again, I'm just going to draw a stub here. I'm going to draw another stub here. And I'm going to draw another stub here. Okay, and again, we're going to use the name command. This will be input. And we say yes, and put the label. I'm going to call this one output. I'm going to say yes. Put it right there. And I'm going to call this one LED. Okay, put it right there. Actually, let's make this nice. I'm going to go ahead and just extend it. Oh, I'm still on the name command. Let's move it, put it right there. I can extend the net, extend the net. There we go. Now we extend the net. Nice, and now everything looks nice and clean. And if we use the show command, and I click on output, you'll see that both segments highlight, see? This highlighted, this highlighted. So by virtue of the fact that they have the same name, they automatically connect. And this helps keep things clean. So at this point, we have all of our components connected, but we have not assigned values to them. So that's the next thing we're going to do. And again, I'm doing everything kind of in step by step, but obviously you don't have to do everything in series like I'm doing it here. You can lay down some components, assign values to them, etc. For the workflow and for the sake of brevity, doing it this way speeds things up. So if you have like a hand-drawn schematic, doing it in this kind of series fashion, you can get it done very quickly. As you can see, we haven't been too long working on this schematic. I'm going to go, we're going to go ahead now and assign values to the components. I'm going to click on value. There's this command here. Now what we can do is I can put in a value in the command line under micro, press enter. Now, every component I click on after that automatically gets that value. So it makes it really easy to assign values to multiple components. Because now I just click on the other electrolytic caps and they automatically get that value. Now, all of these are 100 micro. So now I can keep repeating this process. So I go over here, I click here, I put in 220 nano, hit enter. I know. This one is 220 nano, right here. Oh, it's this one. This one's 220. And again, you can see I haven't stopped the command at all. 
I'm just using the same command the whole time, and I can just assign values to everything. And this is kind of the fastest way to do it. There we are. So at this point, we have everything with values. And you could argue that the schematic is done at this point. This is function. Now, how can we make it better? I'm going to show you now a few tips to make your schematic even more readable and easier to work with. Your future self will think. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of separate. I have room. I'm going to kind of separate things into sections. So I know this section over here, I'm going to go ahead and hit escape to stop the value command because it's still active. Okay, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put this over here. This is power. Okay, this is kind of my offboard connector. Okay, put it over here. Okay, this is just my kind of LED being my active LED. And I can zoom out, get it up a little higher. Okay, put it right there. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of center this and spread it out a little more so I can put in some additional information. So if you notice here in the select command, which is what we default to if no other command is active, you say group of polygon. What this does is you can now form a selection using point to point. You'll see I'm forming a selection polygon. So instead of doing like a rectangle or a marquee selection, as some tools call it, you can make a very, very granular selection by drawing a polygon. At the end, you double click, it'll close, and it'll select everything. So now to move this group, I just have to left click and drag one of its members, and then everything else will move with it. I'm just going to move this over and down a little bit. Just about there. I'm good with that. Okay. Now there's other ways to form selections. So for example, I'm going to turn off over here. The place components, and we're in the design manager. So one way that you can form a selection here in the design manager is using the filter command. And you can specify, let's say I want a part, their names include R. I put an asterisk, and you'll see all the resistors show up. So I could independently select all of the resistors. I could select just the potentiometer. So if I go ahead and put a P here, you'll see it'll only show the potentiometers. And then I can left click and drag. And you'll see that all of the potentiometers are selected. So if you are in a really dense design, this is a godsend. It's, you'll just be able to make really, really granular selections. You can filter components by value, by package type. So, you know, if all these resistors suddenly have to change their values, this makes very quick work of it. Now, in addition to that, you also have the inspector. So, Right now, I still have the selection with polygon. I'm going to hit escape to put it in normal mode. If I go ahead and I select a component here in inspector, I get all of its properties. And as you can see, there's value here, and I can change it this way. So there are many different ways to get your different objectives done. What I showed you at the beginning is if you follow that workflow, you can get things kind of laid out very, very quickly and efficiently. Um, but most of the time, you won't have already a pre design schematic or something you're working off of. So you'll kind of be developing it as you go. So these are, I want to make sure to take the time to illustrate different workflows as we go through this. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and separate out this section. Okay. Because this is going to allow us to document a few things later. So again, selection with polygon. I'm going to go ahead and I just want to have this little section right here. Okay, and again, I left click any member. I can take it, and you'll notice it preserves the angle. So you're not getting any weird obtuse angles here. I'm going to, I'm going to put it here. I'm good with this right here. So right. Okay. I'm going to take these right here. I want to make sure I leave 
at T1 alone. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of take these guys and separate them over here as well. Okay. And finally, I'll take this one and separate it a little bit as well. Now, why did I do this? Well, this is going to allow me to do kind of a section off the circuit into different pieces to document it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to the document menu. And you're going to see that here we have more of our artistic tools. They don't define electrical connectivity. I'm going to go ahead and clear this expression. So here, what we're going to do is I'm going to use, go ahead and use the line command, and we're going to expand its properties. I want its style to be a dash, short dash. Okay, and I'm going to put it just on the info layer. So you'll notice that everything has a color, but what it really has is a layer, and layers can sometimes share colors. So you don't want to get into a habit of associating things strictly by color, you always want to verify what layer they're on because many layers share colors. We have info, and I'm just going to draw a straight line right here. Okay, and again, this is just purely documentation. Okay, perfect. I didn't want this little stub, so I'll select it. Select the stub, delete it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually select this line. I'm going to do a control C. And I'm going to do a control V. And now I have this line that I can place elsewhere in the design. So now I'm seeing that I probably made it too long. I'm going to put it in here. I'll go ahead and either shorten it or shorten this one. I'll do that in a second. Now I want to show you that you also have the copy command here. So if you want to do multiple copies, you can just do activate the copy command, click on the item you want to copy, and it'll immediately copy it. Okay. I'm going to put this one here, and again, they're too long, so I'm going to be adjusting them. But you can see you can just keep you can just keep left clicking, and you'll be able to make as many copies of the item as you want. So let's go ahead and shorten these. I'm going to use the move command to do this. Again, you can either activate the move command or you can do the left click and drag. But move is nice because it stays active. I go over here and I kind of shorten it to the same height more or less. And bring this one up. That's good. So what I've done now is I've divided the design into several sections. Now I have these other segments up here, which I can also enclose. Now I can enclose them in a different way. One way I could do it besides just these manual drawing of divisors, which is very handy. Um, you can also create a persistent group. So I'm going to do that with this set of components here, because these components are always associated together. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Escape, form a selection. And you're going to see how we have this uh, right-click. We get a right-click menu. You'll see that all the commands are available here, so you can do them on following this workflow as well. But what I want to do is I want to create a group. So you're going to notice that here we have New Group. We're going to say it is selectable, and I'm going to say Power. Okay, and I'm going to say OK. And you're going to notice that it gets enclosed by this block, similar to the dash lines that I did, and it has a name power. Now, this is very different than the manual lines that I drew. There's a lot of power associated with, pun intended, the power of uh, persistent groups. So what, what is the benefit here? Basically, this group always exists as a unit. So I can move everything together. Any edits, any modifications are always treated as a unit. 
So if ever I want to, you know, move this around, I want to change something about the group as a unit, I can always select it. What I've done here with the dashed lines, this is purely artistic. So I want to be able, in the case of these, I've gone with this option of drawing, you know, the manual lines because these are big sections of circuitry and having them blocked off fully as a persistent group could be inconvenient. So I've chosen to do these this way. But these other components are good candidates. So small circuit blocks are good candidates for persistent groups. So I'll do the same thing here. I'll put, call this a group. And I'll say, I'll put con. Okay. Move it over here. And then end right here. New group indicator. Okay. And now I can put these in different places, organize them so that the schematic is more readable. I'll put this one here. Maybe I'll put this one, you know, under here. Just kind of keep them separate. Okay, so this is nice. We're starting to, to organize the different blocks. So now I'm going to go ahead and add titles for each of these sections. Now you might be wondering, it's a very simple circuit. Why go through this? It is a simple circuit, but the same principles apply and more advanced circuits and being able to document your schematic makes it that much easier to read it and understand it later on, especially when some time has elapsed. So I'm going to go ahead now and go into document. I'm going to add in some text. Okay. So I'm going to put in names for each section. So I'm going to say input. Okay. And you'll notice it's floating on the mouse cursor right here. So I can make it bigger. I do want these to be a little bit bigger. Let's say maybe that's too big. Let's do 0.15. This is better. Okay, and I'll call this the input section. And I'll put it right here. Input. Okay. Next section will be drive or fuzz. If you see this word, you probably already know what the circuit is. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what it is. And this is not important for the purposes of the tutorial. I'm going to now put the word tone. So I click here, erase it. You can see the command stays active. So I'm going to get this out of the way over here. Tone. And now I'm going to put output. So I click here. Output. Put that right here. Okay. So we can see that this particular circuit is mainly divided into four big sections, and then we have a little bit of support circuitry. I'm going to say OK because I'm done with this command. Okay, so we have input, fuzz, tone, and output. Okay, so we're starting. Now visually, you can break it down into sections, and if you have to analyze anything, you can do so on the basis of just a specific section. You can almost treat independently. So again, just at a glance, we have four main sections and then three little auxiliary circuits that support the four main sections. So at this point, the final thing we can do is add a few notes, a few small notes. So for example, in a circuit like this, it's extremely dependent on the specific transistor. So I may put a note that, you know, feel free to experiment with different NPN transistors. Let's go ahead, text command again. I'm going to put experiment with T1. Now, if I want to put in a new line, because if I keep typing, I'm going to put this over here. If I keep typing, what you'll see is it'll put everything on one line. T1 and T2. Okay, you can see it's putting everything on one line. If I press Shift and Enter while typing in text, so I'm typing in text, Shift and Enter, you'll get a new line. I'm going to put example 2N5088. Two. 
a little space. And now I have this text. Now it's still real big, so let's make it smaller. Maybe take it down to the, I was here, you know, just put it right there. Okay, so there we have our note. And again, you can continue to add notes for different things. So you can specify additional information. If you really wanted to get fancy with your documentation, you could even import an image. But that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. So at this point, we have essentially a completed schematic. Let's go ahead and zoom out, take a quick look, make sure everything looks correct. So this is the zoom to fit button. It'll zoom out and make sure everything fits within the screen. Before we end this episode two of the A to Z project, I want to show you just a couple of things that you'll probably be using as you work through design. One of the big things you'll probably need is a bill of materials. So one way you can generate that is here. So if you notice here in the document, you have these other options for output, and one of them is bill of materials. So left click it, and you'll get this list. Now the list can be sorted in many different ways. One way you can do it, by default it'll do it in parts, but most of the time you're interested in values. So I'll switch it to values, and you'll see it gives you exact amounts of every different value. Any information, any attributes they have defined, they will also be picked up and they'll appear here. So what you can do is, if in your libraries you have, you know, part numbers, you have ordering numbers, you have pricing information, all of that will automatically get picked up. And then you can export this as a text file, as a CSV, as HTML, whatever your distributor best handles to do the ordering for you. And that can save you a lot of time. So one thing to keep in mind, CSV, most people think it's comma-separated values. It's actually character-separated values. And in the case of our Bill of Materials UOP uh, tool here, um, it actually uses semicolons. So keep that in mind if you take it into Excel, the delimiter is a semicolon. The other thing I want to highlight, and again, this design is very simple. Um, we already spoke about the design manager, the filter section, how if you click on a component, you get its attributes here in the inspector. You can also, if you have a very dense design, you can use a selection filter so that it will only grab certain things. So for example, if I only wanted to grab components of this whole design, what I could do is I could go down and select part. You'll see it's the only thing highlighted. And I can make this massive selection. I can just select everything. But you'll notice that the only thing that gets picked up are parts. And you can see it here in the inspector. The inspector shows you attributes of a single component, but it will also show you the attributes that are in common of a group. So if you look, the only thing that got selected are parts. So again, very useful way to make granular selections. Always remember to reset it. Otherwise, you'll find that if you try to pick something, you may not be able to pick it, and you'll forget that you need to reset the selection filter. So with that, we've reached the end of episode two of our A to Z project, drawing the schematic. In our next episode, we're going to learn about how we can do our board layout. Now, a key thing I want to highlight before we switch, before we end this episode, is that if you notice, I have the schematic open, I have the electronics design file open, and I have the 2D PCB open. Okay, and if I zoom out, you'll see that all the components are here ready to be placed. What this lets you know is that the schematic and the 2D PCB are always syncing live. So in order for that to be successful, it is important, it is vital that you always keep the three files open. Do not close one and keep working on the others, because if you do that, then they will no longer sync. So it's very important, keep the three files open together always. If you don't, you're going to find that consistency breaks, and then you'll have to fix it. So make sure you follow that rule. So just to recap, We've added in our components using the add component, the, the place components command. We connected everything using nets. We did labels. We did net stubs. We assigned values to all of our components. We did some additional documentation just to make it easier on ourselves, both manually drawing out uh, separation in the circuit, as well as using persistent groups, which allow us to manipulate sections of the circuit as a unit and they always stay together. So you never have to form the selection again, hence the name persistent group. 
You also saw that we have tools for generating bill of materials and the importance of sticking to a 0.1 inch grid on the schematic or its equivalent 2.54 millimeters, as well as making sure that the electronics design file, the schematic, and the 2D PCB are always open together. So thank you very much for watching this episode. See you next time.